We will also have a, a very quick look at uh, lead directing doubles in, in a more general way right at the end. Um, but most of the time we are going to be looking at uh, non-penalty slam doubles and control denying doubles. Um, and uh, said most of the lessons taken up with that, but we will have a quick look at lead directing doubles at the end. Uh, What we're going to cover tonight is very, very useful, but uh, these are not the kind of doubles that you can conceivably sit down with a scratch partner and agree to play, because you really need to be on uh, the same wavelength and have some agreement as to when the conditions for these kinds of doubles are actually satisfied. So. These kinds of doubles are all about making the right decisions as to whether to bid one more or take a penalty, or if you think it's ops hand and you're sacrificing rather than bidding to make, whether to sacrifice or to try and take a penalty. Um, there's nothing worse than uh, sacrificing at sort of the five or six level and finding afterwards that although you've gone off by 500 or 800 that actually you could have taken them off in their contract so this is these doubles are all about trying to make the right decisions they are not as you'll see as we go through they are not about taking a big penalty which is why they're really called non penalty slam doubles so the doubles are about exchanging information with your partner as to whether you should bid one more, whether you should sacrifice, whether you should just let let ops play whatever level they're in and try and take them off. It's not about trying to take a big penalty. Um, and uh, as such, you may find what's happening on some of these somewhat non-intuitive if you haven't come across these particular doubles before. But like I said uh, right at the beginning, they are incredibly useful if you if you get used to using them and actually use them correctly and are on the same wavelength as partner so that you can really use them for good effect. Okay, I made a comment uh, a little bit earlier this evening. Um, about having to try and decide whether it's your hand or whether it's ops hand. In other words, are we thinking of sacrificing or do we think that ops are potentially sacrificing over our contract and it's really our hand? So making an accurate assessment of that, which is sometimes surprisingly difficult, uh, is, is what this is all about because it makes a difference as to which of these kinds of doubles is applicable to your situation, potentially. As you'll see uh, in some of the example hands tonight and the practice hands, uh, there are times when you may actually think it's your hand and actually it isn't. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to do with the number of points that you think you and partner have compared to ops. Um, a lot of it is to do with trumpet and uh, control of side suits and so on. Um, and uh, quite often it can be quite confusing because, uh, as I said, you think it's your hand and actually it isn't. Okay, um, you will see. Um, Control denying doubles, also referred to as control showing doubles, but actually, because the double tends to deny the control, um, uh, that's why I call them control denying doubles, because it's easy to understand actually what's going on. Okay, so um, control denying doubles are basically when we think it's our hand and they're sacrificing, um, and they're used only in the situation where, firstly, 
they've sacrificed over our game or slam contract, in other words, at the five or six level, and the member of our partnership who is second in hand over their sacrifice isn't the captain of the hand. Or alternatively, there is no captain of the hand at this stage of the bidding. Um, that's quite important. And last, well, next, uh, we haven't established through whatever means, whether it's queue bidding or uh, asking bids or whatever, we haven't actually established firmly whether we have control of their suit. And that's actually the main remaining question in our minds. And uh, the, question, the question that we're thinking of between us and partner is whether we should bid one more and go for the slam or the grand slam, um, or whether we should just go quietly and take a penalty. And the main thing is that the decision as to whether we do one of those things is actually down to whether or not we've got first or second round control of their suit. In other words, we've already, through the bidding, established that we have slam values, but because of their interference, maybe our, our ability to ask all the questions that we wanted to ask or to have the full queue bidding sequence that we wanted, um, we haven't actually been able to really finish that to our satisfaction. And actually, the main question is whether we've got control of their suit. In other words, we're not going to lose one or two quick tricks in their suit because we've established that we've got the power and the tricks elsewhere and the trump control and so on. So I've, I've uh, outlined the four things that uh, need to be met um, before we can actually use control denying doubles. Okay, so if and only if we've established that one to four all apply, um, and again, this is where it's very important that you and partner are actually on a similar wavelength here. Okay, so if all those conditions have been met, then second in hand, who is the person sitting immediately over their sacrifice, passes if they have first round control of the suit if we're at the six level. In other words, we're going to have to bid at the seven level. Or if the bidding's at the five level and we're thinking of bidding at the six level, um, then it's enough for second in hand to pass with first or second round control of the suit because we can afford to lose one trick if we're thinking of bidding at the sixth level. Whereas if we're thinking of bidding at the seventh level, then clearly only first round control of their suit is actually going to be enough. So second in hand over their sacrifice passes if they do have the required level of control in their suit. And if second in hand passes, um, then fourth in hand um, either doubles or bids on, depending on their holding and in the light of whatever second in hand has done, whether they've passed or doubled, because obviously they pass with the desired measure of control, and they double if they don't have control of uh, op suit at the required level. In other words, if they don't have first round control, and we're thinking of bidding at a grand slam, uh, they pass if they do have first round control and double if they don't. If we're thinking of bidding at the sixth level, then they pass with first or second round control, and again, they double if they don't have either of those. So depending on what second in hand does, fourth in hand now 
doubles or bids one more, depending on what they have. So if partners doubled, then uh, to show that they don't have control, then fourth in hand over the sacrifice can bid on if they've got the required degree of control, or if partner has shown control, they either double if they don't fancy the grand slam, or bid on if they do, or the small slam. Any questions so far? Examples are just coming up. So that's your hand. Partners open one spade, you bid four diamonds to show uh, a slam invitation and a splinter in diamonds, um, and uh, your left-hand opponent now comes in with four hearts. Okay, so partner over uh, the four heart interference, partner bids five diamonds, Q bidding the ace of diamonds. Uh, the person on your right bids five hearts. You bid six clubs, which is clearly interested in a grand slam because you're, you're forcing us to uh, a small slam in spades in any case. Your left-hand opponent passes, partner signs off with six spades, and now your right-hand opponent sacrifices in seven hearts. And so the question is what you do if you're playing control-denying doubles. Indeed, pass. Sorry, that should read uh, control denying doubles, not control showing doubles. Um, so if you're playing control denying doubles, you pass to show first round control of hearts. In other words, their suit. If you doubled at this stage, it would deny having the ace of hearts. It's unlikely you're going to have a void because you've already splintered in diamonds. So as I said, uh, you will sometimes see these referred to as control showing doubles, but actually I, I think that's very misleading because the, the, uh, the double is denying control effectively and the pass is what is showing control. So the other thing is that if you really weren't interested in a Grand Slam for whatever reason, you might you might uh, double, um, maybe even uh, conceivably not if you had the Ace of Hearts. But uh, the fact is, when you pass, you're definitely showing that you are potentially interested in playing in a Grand Slam. Uh, of seven spades over their sacrifice of seven hearts because clearly the six club bid was interested in the grand slam anyway because you're forcing the, the, the partnership to a small slam but you're still Q bidding rather than just bidding six spades if you if you just wanted to sign off in six spades you wouldn't bid six clubs you would just bid six spades six clubs is clearly effectively a grand slam force 
Okay, so now when partner has, um, say, king, queens, the six spades, and the ace of diamonds, which they've shown, and they've got second round control of heart, um, clearly uh, they know that you've got the club stone up because of your splinter in diamonds, and they've got now no trouble in bidding seven spades rather than doubling seven hearts. However, if you doubled seven hearts to say, I haven't got the ace of uh, hearts or the avoid in hearts, then clearly they will know that absolutely you can't make seven spades because you're going to lose a heart trick. And so they just let your double uh, ride and uh, you play in seven hearts double rather than trying to make a grand slam that can't possibly succeed. Anybody got any questions so far about uh, um, control denying doubles? One other thing, of course, by the way, if uh, if you doubled to deny having first round control of hearts, but actually they've got it, now they would probably happily bid seven heart, seven spades anyway, despite your double, because clearly you were looking for a grand slam with six clubs, and the, the only real question is whether you've got control of hearts. So if they've got control of hearts, in other words, they've got a better hand than I've shown there, um, then they would probably bid seven spades despite your double. Okay, so here's the other side of the coin. Again, still looking at uh, control denying doubles. Okay, so this time, partner's open two no trumps, just a natural two no trumps. Um, your right-hand opponent passes. You transfer into clubs with three spades, which is clearly um, uh, probably a strong transfer. Um, uh, if it was weak, you'd probably just sign off in three no trumps. And... Uh, your left-hand opponent bids four spades, partner bids five clubs, and your right-hand opponent sacrifices in uh, five spades. And you can tell it's a sacrifice because partner's open two no trumps, and you're sat there with uh, a 12 count. So clearly you've got slam values between you, and uh, so the issue over five spades is whether you double five spades uh, and take a penalty or whether you try for six clubs. So uh, on this occasion, over five spades, you've got uh, two losers in spades. You've got two small spades. So you would double. And because we're at the five level and thinking of bidding at the six level, basically we're denying having either first or second round control of spades. In other words, we've got uh, at least two spades and we haven't got the ace or the king. And now when partners got two small spades, and we've got everything else sewn up, it's easy for them to make the right decision because they know that uh, we're going to have at least two spade losers, and we're almost certainly going to lose them at tricks one and two, given the bidding.
Okay, so in in that uh, um, little example I've given there of one no trump, two diamonds transfer, and then four spades, okay, so some of the conditions are met for this, but not all of them. Okay? Um, you know, so, uh, you know, if you bid five hearts and they sacrifice in five spades, we aren't really in a position to use control denying doubles because we haven't really established all of the uh, all of the conditions that must be met. Um, so we just have to fall back on the natural meanings of double rather than it being control denying. Okay, so has anybody got any questions on uh, control denying doubles? Um, hopefully those examples have, have given you some idea of the kinds of hands where those conditions are met. Um, don't forget, the issues are uh, to do with whether we've established slam values, um, whether second in hand over their sacrifice is either not the captain or there is no captain. If second in hand over the sacrifice is the captain, then really um, it's down to them to decide whether to bid one more or not. Okay? It's, it's because their, their double or pass is effectively giving fourth in hand the option to pass the double or bid one more and so on. Um, if second in hand over the sacrifice is the captain, definitely, then really you shouldn't be using control denying doubles in that particular sequence. Um, you can do, I suppose, but it does muddle up. Um, it does get muddled as to whether captain is actually surrendering the captaincy of the hand, uh, particularly if they double, um, and again also if they pass, uh, because they, if, it's, if they're the captain, they may simply want to pass to give partner the option to bid one more, and it's, but it's not really to do with control denying or showing. Yes, possibly you do. Um, it's 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 hard. Um, you know, I mean, hopefully the bidding so far uh, will have given you some idea as to how valuable your king X in their suit is going to be. Um, you know, if we're thinking of bidding at the sixth level. Uh, if you really, if you've got King X and partners just got two or three small in their suit, I think it's unlikely maybe that they're going to be sacrificing at the five or the six level um, or even the seven level um, when they've only got an eight card fit. So if you've got as much as King X or King XX, it's unlikely that your partner's got more than one of their suits. But yes, potentially you do have to take that into account. But I would pretend, I, I think personally I would still show the control um, because if partner's got, for example, the queen or a singleton and you're thinking of bidding at the sixth level, um, it doesn't necessarily matter. Uh, and I mean, hopefully uh, you will have established enough about the hand that... Um, you know, partner will have some idea as to 
the degree of control that you're likely to have when you pass over their sacrifice as to whether it's first or second round control. Um, but you need to you need to be aware of that certainly. Good question. Thank you. Okay, uh, has anybody else got any questions about control denying doubles? Um, I, I do have some example hands, but again, I run into the the normal problem that I can't be sure of the order in which these hands appear when I'm using the uh, um, the browser client. Um, so I'd rather leave them till the end and just use them as it, as practice hands. Um, so I'm not really intending to, because uh, I don't have that many hands, I'm not really intending to use the example hands I have as examples. I'd rather keep them for practice hands at the end, in which case it doesn't necessarily matter what order they actually come up with. Okay, let's uh, move on to... Uh, uh, non-penalty slam doubles, which is a little bit more complicated than what we've seen so far. Oops, sorry, I sent that twice by mistake. Not quite sure how I managed that. Okay, I, I say that this mainly applies at the sixth level, and that's the 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 math if you like, that you have to do um, is is why that is because you have to adjust um, uh, how you use uh, non-penalty slam doubles if, for example, the bidding's at the five level um, the issue is um, not quite the same. So it, it does get very much more complicated if you're at the, the five level or the seven level. So the way this works is that uh, we've established that it's their hand but we're potentially sacrificing and they've eventually bid a small slam at the, the six level. Okay? And second in hand passes if they have one or more defensive tricks and doubles if they have no defensive tricks and this is all non-penalty slam doubles is not about taking a penalty or a big penalty because it doesn't matter as, as I'll stress in a minute okay it's about not sacrificing when we think we've probably got two tricks that's what it's all about So second in hand passes with one or unlikely but with two defensive tricks and they double if they don't have any defensive tricks. Okay, so there are Two, op two sets of options, basically, depending on whether second in hand passed over the, their bid or whether they doubled. So 
if second in hand passed to show one or more defensive tricks, then uh, fourth in hand passes if they have one or more defensive tricks themselves. Because if partner's got at least one defensive trick and we've got one defensive trick, then we think they've got we've got two defensive tricks. In other words, we don't think they can make their contract. And so there's absolutely no point in sacrificing when they're going off because it's their hand. We don't need to make a big penalty. If it's their hand, even a small plus score is going to be a good result. We don't need to double. Okay, so if second in hand pass to show one or more defensive tricks, now fourth in hand doubles if they don't have any defensive tricks. So now we've got one or maybe two defensive tricks, but fourth in hand hasn't got any of them. And so now the bidding goes back to second in hand, and now they sacrifice if they've got only one defensive trick, because if we're only going to take one trick, we're potentially wanting to sacrifice over their slam, because we don't think we can defeat it. But if they've got two or more defensive tricks, then obviously they pass over fourth in hand double, because now we still think we've got two defensive tricks. Okay, so if second in hand doubles to show no defensive tricks, now fourth in hand passes if they've got two defensive tricks or more, which is very unlikely, but um, so fourth in hand passes if, if they've got two tricks, and if they've got no tricks or only one defensive trick, fourth in hand sacrifices. So hopefully here you can see that um, this is why it works very easily when we're at the sixth level, because it's a matter of whether we've got one defensive trick or not, or more than one or none. Uh, if we're at the five level, it does get a lot more complicated, and you have to adjust uh, all of those numbers that I've just shown you, because it's a matter of whether we've only got two defensive tricks or whether we've actually got three. Um, and really, it becomes very difficult to, uh, to manage it. Similarly, at the seven level, um, you can still use them uh, if our suit's higher ranking. But uh, again, the maths works slightly differently because it becomes a matter of whether we've got a defensive trick somewhere or not. Um, we couldn't really care less if we've got two defensive tricks. It's only a matter of whether we've got actually any defensive tricks at all. Okay, so as I said before, non-penalty slam doubles are not about getting a big penalty. There may be some occasions where we end up uh, playing in their contract, us having doubled it, um, but it's purely accidental if that's the case, because the doubles are um, to do with counting our defensive tricks, and quite often we'll just end up letting them play in their slam without doubling because we think we've got two defensive tricks or more. So just remember, it's not about getting a big penalty. These, uh, these doubles are about passing information and actually counting up reliably uh, how many defensive tricks we have. Now, what is a defensive trick? that becomes a critical point here. And uh, I'm 
think uh, the following example, hopefully, will make it a little bit clear as to what we do and don't consider to be a defective trick. Okay, so what is a defensive trick? And uh, it's, it's notoriously hard to be absolutely certain as to uh, whether your count of, of defensive tricks is accurate. Um, okay, aces are normally a pretty good bet. But you have to give ops a little bit of credit here. If you think you've got at least a 10-card trump fit your way, uh, then I wouldn't necessarily be sure that the ace of your suit is going to carry as a trick. Uh, you have to give ops a little bit of credit um, for bidding sensibly, uh, especially if you think you end up having two defensive tricks, one of which is the ace of the suit that you and partner have been bidding, because it's entirely possible that actually the ace of their suit is not going to take a trick. Okay, so similarly, uh, things like king-queen in a genuine side suit would be a good bet for a defensive trick. In other words, it's not your trump suit, it's one of the other suits. Uh, so something like king-queen uh, is a fairly good bet for a trick in a side suit where you and partner haven't shown any particular length. Um, and similarly, combinations such as, and I've said there, you know, Queen Jack X or Jack 10 9 X in their suit are a very good bet for a defensive trick. Uh, some of this does depend on. Uh, whether their chump on is a split. Um, if you think the person on your left has got the ace-king, um, then I would be less sure that queen-jack-x is going to take a trick, especially if you end up showing that you've got a defensive trick there somewhere. You may be telling ops actually the right way to play the trump suit if they know that you think you've got a trick somewhere in, and it's possibly in chumps. And similarly, um, if you think the person on your left has got Jack 10 9x, again, you wouldn't necessarily think that Jack 10 and 9x can be guaranteed to make a trump uh, trick. Uh, but I'd actually be happier with Jack 10 9x in the trump suit than Queen Jack X. Uh, if you think it's likely that the trump on is a split, then these sorts of considerations don't really apply. Okay, so... Uh Honor suits, uh, honor cards in side suits that seem to be well placed given the bidding. Um, so if, uh, for example, the person on your right has cubid diamonds and you sat there with king x in diamonds, uh, that looks like a pretty good bet that you might have a, tr a trick there, for example. Um, uh, um, you may... Uh, you may think you might get a rough somewhere, but it's not normally something you can count on. Um, uh, and especially if you've got the ace of the suit and you think that partner's probably short in it, uh, and that's not the trump suit, obviously, then uh, you might 
hope that you're going to get a rough there, but I don't think you can necessarily count it as a defensive trick. Okay, any questions so far on what we do tend to count as defensive tricks and what we don't? Again, there's no black and white formula here. You just have to assess your hand in the light of the bidding, uh, what you do know about partner's hand, what you know about your likely trump fit, um, and the bidding so far, what ops have cubed, what they haven't cubed, and so on. Um, you have to take all of that into account, and even then, sometimes you may think you've got a you may think you've got a cast down defensive trick, and actually it turns out that you haven't. Um, so there is no magic formula for this where you're going to be right the whole time. All you can do is to take your best guess uh, and then hope it's right. Okay, I think I do have uh, one example. This is a fairly easy one. Uh, here we go. So in this example, we're sat here with uh, a void spade, five uh, hearts of the jack, um, ace x in diamonds, and ace to six clubs. And your left hand opponent opens one spade, and partner bids a weak jump over calling clubs by bidding three clubs. Um, right hand opponent bids four clubs, you bid five clubs, left hand opponent bids five spades partner passes, your right-hand opponent bids six spades. So now what do you do? The thing we have to recognize here is that there is absolutely a zero chance that the ace of clubs is going to be a defensive trick. If partners made a, a weak jump over calling clubs, uh, they're going to have six of them. So the likelihood is that at least one, if not both, of your opponents are voiding clubs. However, you can be certain that the, or fairly certain, that the ace of diamonds is going to be a trump trick. And it's worth noting here that if you're not playing non-penalty slam doubles, you've got a problem here because uh, you've got to make a decision here over six spades. Um, you might double um, on the basis that you know that uh, the ace of diamonds is going to be a trick and you just hope that partner's got a trick somewhere. But you can't be sure. And uh, as I said right at the beginning, this is all about making, helping you and partner to make the right decisions. Because there's no point uh, you bidding seven clubs and sacrificing over six spades if you actually have two defensive tricks between you and partner. So if you are playing non-penalty slam doubles, uh, it becomes a lot easier because you just have a formula here to do. So over there, six spades, you pass, as uh, uh, my friend there says, you pass to show one or more defensive tricks. You know it's only one. Partner doesn't know whether it's one or two, but he knows that you've got at least one defensive trick. So now if partner's got a hand like, say, Queen Jack X in spades, a singleton heart, some small diamonds, and six clubs, they can be fairly sure that probably the, uh, the Queen Jack X in spades is also a defensive trick. And so they just pass. So you don't double six spades, but the fact is you don't sacrifice in seven clubs, 
because between you and partner, you can work out that you've probably got two defensive tricks. You know, you can work that out. Uh, so you pass, and then that's it. However, if partners just got a worse hand with, say, three to the jack in uh, spades, they don't have any defensive tricks. Okay, because you're not normally going to count tricks in uh, your trump suit when it looks like you and partner have got a massive trump fit because you have to give ops credit uh, for not being completely suicidal. Okay, so now uh, if you pass to show one or more defensive tricks, they would double to show no defensive tricks in their hand, and now you would sacrifice because you can be fairly certain that six spades is making, and uh, you just take your chances in seven clubs on the basis that it's probably going to be a reasonably good sacrifice. Okay, any questions on non-penalty slam doubles? Um, that's a fairly easy example, but it's, it's enough to show uh, how the maths works and how you pass information by means of pass and double. Uh, it is, as I said, a little bit more complicated than the control denying doubles, uh, but hopefully that example will have shown you the value um, and how it actually gets you to the right decision depending on what you have and what partner has. Anybody got any questions? Okay, so I mentioned uh, um, we were going to have a quick look at lead directing doubles, and this is more in the way of just general advice. Um, so here we go. Okay, so having said what I've said there, um, obviously there are times when you can't be sure who's going to end up as declarer. Um, it may not be, you know, it may be too early in the bidding when you have the chance to make a lead directing double and you can't be sure. So sometimes you do just have to take your chance. Um, but if, it's, if we've got to a fairly high level when you make your lead directing double, there is no point in, in making that lead directing double if you can be fairly sure that you're going to be on the opening lead. Um, because all you're effectively doing is either tipping ops off to the fact that uh, um, you think you've got a trick there, um, or the fact that a suit might be breaking badly, um, or that, uh, you know, they may have a couple of quick losers in that particular suit, okay? So if you think, if you think you're going to be on lead, I would just keep quiet and uh, keep that up your sleeve as a surprise.
Okay, so um, as I've said there in that kind of example, that's a sort of fairly classic uh, uh, example of a, a double of three no trumps being for a spade lead, given that your uh, partner is going to be on lead and your right hand opponent has bid spades. Um, that's a fairly clear request for a spade lead here. Um, so you don't necessarily have to double spades in order to make a lead directing double. Uh, wait until ops have effectively committed themselves to three no trumps and now maybe double to try and get uh, the tempo by getting partner to lead spades through your right-hand opponent um, in the hope that uh, partner may be able to get the lead again at some point later in the auction and be able to end the bidding right in the play rather and actually be able to uh, um, make the uh, another lead in the suit to really give up some problems. But you need to have a fairly, as I've said there, you need to have a fairly clear indication that it really is going to make a difference for partner to lead that suit. If you've got a very porous holding like, you know, king nine, eight, x, x, you don't know for sure um, that it's going to be the difference between making the contract or not making the contract. Um, and... Uh, you can't even be sure that actually your right-hand opponent necessarily actually has the ace. Uh, and okay, the chances are that you're going to make your king of spades at some point, but you're not going to get rich on spades when you've got a holding like king, nine, eight, x, x. Um, Ellie asks if, if your right-hand opponent has bid two suits. Um, again, it's a matter really, this is the sort of thing that actually you and your partner need to discuss uh, in those kind of circumstances um, as to whether you're asking for their first bid suit, which is possibly longer and stronger, if they've then subsequently shown a second suit, um, that might well be a weaker and shorter suit on just on the basis of how natural bidding normally goes. So personally, I would take a, a subsequent double of uh, your left-hand opponent's Fino Trump contract as asking for a lead of the second suit rather than the first suit. But again, uh, um, you've potentially got the chance if right-hand opponent has bid, say, diamond spades first and diamond second, uh, it's unlikely if they start bidding three diamonds, for example, um, that actually they're seriously suggesting playing in diamonds, and so you could uh, you could actually double the three diamond bid to specifically ask for diamonds. Um, and but again, just bear in mind that you are tipping ops off, and now you can be absolutely certain that. Ops will never touch diamonds at all because you've asked for a diamond lead. They know they will be able to tell almost certainly exactly the sort of position that there is in diamonds, and they're just not going to touch it. And if your partner can't lead the suit twice, it's unlikely that you're actually going to get a huge amount of advantage. Whereas if you stay quiet, it's entirely possible that Ops will actually try and lead diamonds at some point, uh, unsuspecting because you haven't said anything, you haven't given the information away, um, and you may be better off actually keeping mum. But uh, again, it's the sort of sort of situation that you need to discuss with your partner. This is the sort of thing that determines or differentiates between really solid partnerships uh, defensively and ones where you're just floating around and not really sure of what's going on. So you need to have some kind of agreement as to what a double would mean when responder has bid two suits, uh, but 
De Clara on your left has ended up playing in three no trumps. Um, sort of thing you need to discuss, okay? Okay, the next thing is is that if you're making a lead directing double at a low level, you have to be prepared for the fact that partner uh, might actually uh, start competing in the suit. Um, if you're simply going to start making a lead directing double as, say, an artificial bid, uh, that they've made at a fairly low level just because you've got, I don't know, ace, queen, jack of the suit. Uh, I think that would be dangerous. Firstly, at, at a low level, you can't be sure that they're going to end up in the sort of contract where it's really going to make a difference. Um, and B, there's a good chance that partner, if you don't actually have length as well as strength in the suit, that actually partner's probably going to have some length and strength and uh, they might well uh, start competing in the suit. And again, the last thing is, don't forget that you are always giving ops information away when you make a lead directing double. Um, very often, it's actually better to not reveal uh, the potential problem to ops. Um, you know, it may be that if partner's going to be on lead and they can make that lead at trick one, that that's actually going to be the killing thing. And that's fine. And, and in that case, it doesn't really matter that you've given uh, information away to ops. But, I mean, there's loads, you know, the bridge books and examples of hands are full of situations where, you know, people make an ill-judged, um, say, a lead directing double of um, something, thinking that ops are going to play in six spades by west, and actually they end up playing in six no trumps by east as a result because they've been tipped off to the fact that um, you know, a diamond lead through uh, east at trick one is actually going to be the killing, uh, the killing blow. So they end up playing in six no trumps by east, where now south is on lead, and actually you don't have the advantage anymore. Um, said bridge books and bridge magazines are full of hands like that. Uh, so lead directing doubles always give information away to ops, as well as potentially giving you and partner some advantage. So, uh, um, you know, you need to be fairly sure that A, a lead by partner in this suit is really going to be advantageous, but also um, that actually ops have got nowhere else to go. If they can potentially escape from the situation that they're in by bidding something else, which is going to put you on lead rather than partner, then you've potentially just given the game away. Um, so uh, very often you will find that actually keeping everybody in the dark and just hoping that you are going to get a chance at some point to make your two tricks or whatever uh, is actually a better policy. So here's an example, um, ops are bidding, uh, it's gone one diamond, they're playing two over one, one diamond, two over two diamonds, new minor forcing, uh, sorry, uh, inverted minor suit raises rather, not, not new minor forcing, um, uh, two spades by west, uh, or by opener, four spades on your right, um, Left-hand opponent comes in with the uh, Roman key card Blackwood. Right-hand opponent bids five diamonds um, to show uh, one or four aces. 
and you sat with the Ace of Diamonds here and nothing else. Do you want to double or not? Okay, the fact is here, you might think, well, yeah, I mean, I've got the Ace of Diamonds and there's a good chance that partner's shorting diamonds because of the one diamond, two diamond sequence to start with. But, um, you know, so a diamond lead is almost certainly going to defeat the contract uh, when uh, ops are going to end up in uh, six spades, potentially. But uh, what you have to consider is this. Okay, if partners got, if they end up in six spades and partners got a singleton in diamonds, they're going to lead it if they're on lead and they, if they, in a spade contract, they would be on lead. Uh, if they've got nothing else more attractive, um, they probably will lead their singleton anyway. So you don't need to double from that point of view. Um, of course, they might be void in diamonds, and actually now the double does you no good because they can't actually lead one. Um, and similarly, it's possible entirely that they've actually got a doubleton in diamonds, and now uh, the diamond lead is, okay, you're going to take your ace to diamonds, but actually that may have given ops the tempo, uh, whereas a lead in another suit might have... Uh, actually been more decisive. So hopefully that's given you some idea of, of my feelings on lead directing doubles, that there are occasions when they are an absolute killer, where ops have got nowhere to go, and it clearly points partner in the direction of the killing lead uh, that's really going to make a difference. Um, but if there's a good chance that partner would find that lead anyway, or if ops have, have got somewhere else that they can potentially end up in, um, then uh, uh, quite often it's better to stay quiet. Anybody got any questions about lead directing doubles? Again, a lot of this is is not guesswork but there's no there's no right and wrong answer you just have to use your best judgment um and sort of keep an eye on the bidding during the course of the bidding uh and then try if you get a chance to make a lead directing double to uh make a decision then fairly quickly as to whether to come in with it bearing in mind that if you sit for hours thinking about whether to bid over this five diamond bid in that example I just gave you, um, then that's really unauthorized information to partner because clearly the only thing that you can sensibly be thinking of here is whether to double five diamonds or not. And uh, so if you pause for a long time and then pass, you're effectively uh, being unethical in the sense of uh, giving part of the information without actually making the lead directing double. And then on the ball, TD uh, would cane you uh, if somebody complained. Okay, if uh, nobody's got any questions, uh, I've got some example hands and practice hands. Um, so I'll stand, and if I can have four volunteers to sit, please. Again, I don't want to always sit for hours. Uh, it doesn't matter really uh, what system you're going to play. Um, however, uh, if you want to sit as a partnership rather than an individual, please feel free. Um, I don't mind if you're playing two over one or standard American or ACOL or whatever. Um, please just sit uh, because these hands aren't really uh, system specific and how you get to uh, the fairly high levels doesn't necessarily matter.
So can I please have four victims or volunteers uh, to sit? Thank you. Don't be shy. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, another two, please. That's one player sitting north-south who are going to be presumably playing two over one or standard American or something. Uh, maybe if we could have a, um, a precision pair or an OCP player playing uh, uh, east-west, that might be uh, quite interesting to see the contrast in styles. But please, somebody just shout up uh, or sit because uh, I don't want to spend um, half the, uh, the time available just waiting for somebody to sit. Come on, Mr. Loot. Or somebody. Ellen, please don't be worried about making mistakes. This is the first time you've probably ever heard of non-penalty slam doubles and control denying doubles. If you make mistakes, Mistakes, it absolutely does not matter, okay? Um, don't be nervous about missing because this isn't, you know, for demonstration purposes. In many instances, it actually uh, um, produces a better result, actually, if people do make mistakes. Because uh, that ends up allowing me to show uh, by examples and comments at the end um, different facets of the hand and, uh, you know, the reasons why you've possibly made the decisions that you have. So please don't worry about uh, getting this wrong. You know, that's, I wouldn't say that's the point of it, but uh, hopefully some of these decisions will be fairly easy. And I may well stop the bidding at some point, okay, uh, because Sometimes it may not be obvious to you that you've actually got the critical to the critical point where one or other of these kinds of doubles actually apply. Now, actually, this isn't one of the hands that I was intending doing, but it's potentially quite an interesting hand. So uh, we'll just see how we go on with this. Now, I'm presuming that North-South are not playing uh, um, competitive Levin Sol. Uh, so here, North has uh, made a jump cubid of West Diamonds, which is normally uh, showing a cubid and, uh, sorry, a shortage in their suit. I would actually normally play that as a void, but uh, again, um, North-South probably don't have any firm agreements here, so... Uh, I would just take it as a shortage, not necessarily a void. And it's certainly suggesting possibly uh, a contract higher than four hearts, and it tends to be agreeing hearts. Um, if North simply wanted to play in four hearts, they could just bid four hearts over two diamonds. So four diamonds tends to be suggesting possibly something more than that.
Okay, very good. We might as well play this one. It's quite an interesting uh, play hand as well. So I think a uh, very good decision by uh, South here over five hearts. Okay, uh, good, good try, Ellen. Um, uh, unlucky decision in hearts, really. Um, I think possibly uh, there is a case for running the ten of hearts here. If West has got the king jack x, then clearly nothing is going to help you. Um, so playing for East to have at least one of the honours in hearts uh, seems like a reasonable uh, gambit to take. So if you run the 10 uh, and that loses to the jack or the king, if it loses to the king, then you can be certain that east has got the jack uh, and you're well placed to uh, only lose one heart and one diamond. Um, whereas if you play the queen and then the ace, you're definitely vulnerable to east having four hearts. Now, um, Given the two diamond bid by West, you now know a lot more about West's hand in the sense that they've probably got five or six diamonds at least uh, than you do about East, who has stayed silent during the bidding. So uh, it's a good plan to, to put the heart length with East, and that would suggest running the ten of hearts on the first round, rather than taking a finesse to the Queen. Anybody else got any comments or questions? Like I said, that wasn't one of the hands that I'd prepared, but uh, uh, it was quite an interesting play hand uh, and potentially bidding. Good decision by South to stop uh, at five hearts, obviously, knowing that there's two key cards missing. Um, uh, there's no case really for bidding six. Six can be made, but uh, you'd have to have x-ray specs. 
Anybody else got any questions? Okay, um, this is actually one of the hands I used as an example. Uh, I would have expected, as I said privately to Ellen, um, possibly four hearts by uh, south over four diamonds. Um, seems fairly clear to me to come in at that stage. Um, and uh, the thing is here, uh, given the sequence that we actually had, what should South do over six spades? The point is, South should be doubling 
as she did, to show no defensive tricks because they don't have any defensive tricks. But again, because North-South weren't on the same wavelength, uh, North hasn't taken it as that because they don't actually have any defensive tricks. Uh, yes, they've got some heart support and they've got uh, the King of Diamonds, but uh, they know that East is short in diamonds because of the four diamond bid. And so they can't really count any defensive tricks. So actually, over the double of six spades, North should be bidding seven hearts. And now the, uh, the control denying double or pass comes in over seven hearts. And East should be passing to show first round control of uh, hearts. And now it's fairly easy uh, for West to potentially bid seven spades. We didn't have exactly the same sequence that I had in the example, but that's fine. Uh, these things just progress at the rate that they that they will. But um, uh, it is important that you are on the same wavelength as partner and this is clearly an example where north south actually weren't on the same wavelength because uh, south clearly intended the double to be showing no defensive tricks and potentially inviting partner to uh, sacrifice but north took it as uh, a penalty double effectively instructing them not to sacrifice and so they didn't uh, very clear support for the idea that actually it really helps if you and partner have discussed these kinds of situations. Anybody got any questions on this hand? It doesn't matter, Ben. These are the first time that you've actually come across these kinds of situations in anger it would be quite surprising if you immediately got it right, okay? Uh, so don't worry about it, like I said before. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's almost counterintuitive compared to how you've probably played before now. If I was playing with a completely scratched partner, uh, I wouldn't even dream of playing uh, non-penalty slam doubles, in which case, the double of six spades, I would take it as being, I've got six spades covered, don't sacrifice. That's what the double would mean if you're not playing non-penalty slam doubles. Hard to suddenly turn that on its head. I think this is love all, this particular hand, Ellen. Uh, Amelie, rather.
Okay, so again, uh, this sequence didn't uh, quite go uh, as I'd planned it. Um, I, I would say, given that the double of three spades is uh, clearly showing spades, and north-south are now in, embarking on a cubiting sequence, uh, having presumably agreed to playing subs, that actually at some point east, might want to actually show that they've got some spade support um, as a possible sacrifice, even at love all. And uh, that would then have paved the way potentially for uh, um, a control-denying double uh, of uh, five spades over five clubs. Oh, no. I mean, three, uh, um, I think the way most people will play transfers over two no trumps, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, north-south, um, I would, certainly I would play three spades as a transfer specific to, to, to clubs. If you're playing four-suit transfers, um, we don't know what south north-south are playing. Um, but uh, certainly over five clubs, it's obvious that uh, South specifically has clubs and that the four diamonds and four heart bids were cubits. Um, but uh, well done, North-South, for uh, stopping at the five level. Um, once uh, South bids five clubs, it's obvious that they don't have the ability to cubit spades. Um, and uh, so... North is quite right, right to pass five clubs, given that they don't have a spade control. Yes, absolutely right, Ben. Um, South is the captain. But uh, again, uh, they're the captain at the point where they bid three spades and when they bid four diamonds. But when they bid five clubs, they're effectively giving up the captaincy and saying, oh, this is why I think we should play. So actually they're no longer the captain at that point because they've signed off. Uh, all I'm saying is that you're quite right not to bid on over five clubs because the five club bid clearly is denying a spade control. And uh, since you don't have a spade control, five clubs is maybe even too high already, but certainly it's the limit. Don't forget, guys, in these hands that actually, um, you know, they are meant to be competitive hands because you only get these kinds of decisions when you have some fairly high-level competition and competitive bidding. So if you don't get involved in the bidding, then the chances are that the point of the hand is not going to materialize.
Okay, guys, so just stop there a minute. Okay, we use bid six base. Okay, that's fine. All I was going to say is, uh, over six clubs, West's pass is uh, control showing, effectively. Um, a double of six clubs here would be denying control of clubs. Um, so the pass over six clubs is effectively promising first or second round control of clubs. So it's reasonable in the circumstances, given the four club bid uh, from West initially, it's reasonable uh, for East to bid six spades over um, West's pass. So now we come back down to north-south. And now we're in the non-penalty slam double area over six spades. So again, here, Ellen should be passing if she thinks she has uh, one or more defensive tricks and doubles if she thinks she doesn't have any defensive tricks against six spades. That's how this works. No, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll uh, get back to the hand in question, and it uh, um, doesn't necessarily matter uh, whether you're north or south. Um,
Okay, so just go through the bidding again, uh, just roughly as it was before. Um, we just want to end up with a situation where um, east west of bid six spades after north south of uh, sacrificed in six clubs. And uh, as long as it ends up as east bidding six spades, uh, we then have the interesting situation of what north south are going to do over east six spade bids. Okay, so if we go past past six spades by east, and then we're, we've effectively arrived at the sort of situation that I was trying to show here. Okay, so as I was saying before, uh, my Internet Explorer crashed. At this point, south has a decision to do. If, if north-south are playing non-penalty slam doubles, which I hope they are, um, so now, um, South would pass if they felt they had one or more defensive tricks, and they would double if they felt they had no defensive tricks. Okay, uh, um, so that was actually a good example of non-penalty slam doubles in operation here. Um, so South passes over six spades, saying that they think they've got one or more defensive tricks. And then it comes round to North, and he thinks, well, I've got the ace diamonds. Neither of us have shown any length of diamonds, so it's very unlikely that the ace of diamonds is not going to be a trick. And therefore, we think we have two defensive tricks and therefore they just pass rather than sacrificing over six spades. Okay, the vulnerability was probably wrong for it anyway, but uh, that was an example here. And I mean, you can't really say that East-West have done anything particularly wrong. Um, you know, the, uh, the information wasn't always available to them. Um, I'm not sure I would necessarily have bid four clubs over one spade. Um, West isn't really strong enough for that, but that's a matter of style. 
Um, but uh, uh, it was a useful hand to show uh, uh, non-penalty slam doubles in operation. Anybody got any questions? I think we've just about got time for one more hand. Yes, I think uh, Duffer. I think your your pass over six clubs uh, is definitely showing control of uh, of clubs. That was the other thing on this sequence. Um, uh, so you're in a um, a control denying situation there if you double six clubs. So pass is clearly showing control of clubs, and I mean on that basis, um, I guess that. Uh, East felt that they were entitled to bid six spades, and I think that they're, they're entitled to think that you might be a little bit stronger than you actually were for your four club splinter initially. Um, but again, that's a matter of style. Uh, I don't really play splinters the way that you guys probably do, so you may have a better understanding um, of. Uh, what East was expecting for the club, for the four club bid. Yes, I, I mean you know she's got first or second round control, um, uh, Ryo. But uh, um, again, it depends on your understanding of splinters. Uh, some people play splinters as always being a void. Um, I think, given the uh, the four club bid, it's likely that your pass over six clubs is maybe confirming that you've got avoiding clubs. Um, it's more, it's a little bit more obvious if South had bid two clubs over one spade. Now four clubs is definitely a void in most people's systems, and so the subsequent bidding may have been clearer. Certainly, the pass over six clubs. Okay, anybody else got any questions? Okay, uh, next one. Guys, don't get these, these hands are going to fall flat if we don't actually get any interference. Yes, I like five hearts here. Nice bid, Ellen. Because four clubs is clearly a green spade. Um, so it's not like five hearts can be 
interpreted as suggesting that you want to play in hearts rather than spades. Okay. Oh, I think we might just squeeze one more in. I think just uh, just lead and uh, north south can claim two tricks because that's all they're going to get here. Um, I, I have to say, uh, I think given the four club bid, I, I mean, I don't know what north south are understanding with four clubs. Four clubs, I, I would play splinters as unequivocally slam invitational, agreeing partners suit, and showing a control in clubs, showing a shortage in clubs. So when East bids five clubs, uh, South passes, um, possibly to give North a bit of room, North bids five hearts which is clearly a control and wanting to cubid towards a spade slam. South signs off in five spades, showing no particular interest, and it's true they've got nothing they can easily cubid here. West comes in with six clubs, and North now passes to show the club control. I mean, they've already cubid um, splintered in clubs. Uh, and so clearly... I think North is pushing towards the slam here, and now South has just doubled to show absolutely no interest. Um, but uh, it, it's fairly clear that, uh, I mean, I don't know whether um, South has doubled because North hasn't shown a diamond control. Um, but uh, if that's the reasoning, then that's fair enough. But uh, I think I would have uh, done something other than doubling uh, over six clubs. I think double is saying, listen, I'm just really not interested in playing in six spades. We'll just take a penalty. And, I mean, as you'll see, uh, if you lead and claim, so that you can see all the hands, uh, six clubs doubled is a really good result for East-West because they're only losing two tricks. Again, Ellen, I, I, I mean, I do think it, it depends on your understanding of what four clubs means. You know, I mean, I would normally take four clubs as being a stronger hand than you actually have. I mean, I think South is entitled to expect you to have a very good hand. Um, uh, and so I think he should be more optimistic, really. Uh, if you didn't have any control of diamonds and you've got a club shortage, you know, what else can you have? Um, you know, you, you can't really have that strong a hand if you don't have a control in diamond, because you, you, you're unlikely to have 
much in the way of top cards in clubs when you've got a shortage in the suit. Partner's got the ace, king of spades, so you can only possibly have the queen and maybe the jack. Um, and the ace, king of hearts. I mean, that's only a nine count. Uh, you know, it's almost inconceivable that you haven't got the ace or the king of diamonds. Given your choice of five hearts, I would assume that you've got the king of diamonds. And you've probably got some length there somewhere if you've got a, space, a, a club shortage. So I, I, think, I think South has just been a little bit too pessimistic here, maybe. Um, but again, it's, uh, if South can just lead against six clubs and, uh, and then just claim, um, just claim so that everybody can see the cards, and then it'll be a little bit more obvious. And, and I'd be uh, happy to hear any other interpretations of what should be going on here um, from people who play two over one and standard American stuff and who actually use splinters, because I don't. Okay, so uh, as you can see, uh, East West are only going to lose one diamond um, and uh, and one heart, so they're only going one off in six clubs double, which is a spectacularly good result at any vulnerability, given that uh, six spades is absolutely icy cold. Um, and uh, um, the the thing is, is really what. You guys who play two over one and standard American are, are, would normally be understanding by four clubs here. Would you be expecting the sort of hand that North has, or something maybe a little bit stronger? Well, I, I mean, Alan, I think that's true, and I mean that's why I'm saying what I am saying. You know, if you've got a club shortage, you can only possibly have the Ace King Jack of Hearts and the queen jack of spades, that's only an 11 count. Uh, and people don't normally splinter um, on, on weak hands, it's normally on hands that uh, you're wanting to push towards a slam. There's all sorts of ways that, that North can bid this over one spade pass. I, I fully agree. Um, I think I would have gone for a two diamond bid and then four spades. Uh, but, um, okay, I, I mean, if you guys have a different understanding of, of what four clubs means, then that's different. Um, but clearly, uh, something went wrong here because... Um, uh, North South haven't got to six spades, and they clearly had a chance to do that. I, I mean, I would take four clubs as forcing game in a slam try, as Rogers just said. Somebody said that uh, it doesn't have to be that; that it would be um, maybe as little as an eleven count, and maybe just a route to get to four spades. Why not just bid four spades if that's the case? So, Charlene, are you saying that in two over one, you think four clubs is essentially a, a relatively, not a strong bid, but a sort of a fairly weak bid almost? Okay, fair enough. If North South have got that agreement, then that's fine. Um, but uh, okay, uh, fair enough. Um, but I, I, again, if it's a distributional game, then the chances are, um, yeah. But I mean, South doesn't suffer 
itself doesn't have anything wasted in clubs. Okay, no problem. Anyway, uh, interesting hand. Um, uh, if anybody else has got any suggestions over, given uh, the apparent agreement about what the four club bid is showing as to how North South can actually get to six spades here, because clearly they ought to be, uh, I'd be happy to hear it. Okay, yeah, if nobody else wants to send anything, we'll, we'll just try one more. Yes, I mean, I, I, mean, I think we're agreed that there are uh, a number of different ways that North South could start the bidding on that hand. One spade two diamonds is clearly an acceptable route. Uh, one spade four clubs is apparently fairly normal, uh, given what you said about what you think a sprinter shows. Um, uh, one spade two no trumps is uh, possibly on the weak side for that, maybe, uh, for Jacoby. Uh, again, it depends on your understanding. Yeah.
just play this one out, guys. Uh, this is an interesting uh, hand. Okay, yeah, unlucky bin. Uh, classic case of why are you roughing diamonds at trick two when East has bid one diamond and West has led one? How many diamonds did you think West had? Uh, and what's the rush to start roughing them before you've drawn trumps or at least establish what the trump position is? Uh, so slightly careless play here, um, there's, uh, you can actually make six hearts on the north-south cards, um, and the, the idea of this hand was actually that it's one of these hands where you think it's east-west hands because they've got the preponderance of the points, but actually uh, the only slam that can be made is by north-south. So north-south thought they were sacrificing, but actually they can make six hearts. And east-west think that they're in the position where uh, control denying doubles apply. Um, but really, it's the other way around. They're thinking, and they should be thinking in terms of sacrificing, as it turns out. But it's almost inevitable that they're going to get it wrong in that sense. But there's a clear case here for taking at least one round of trumps to cross back to the north hand um, before starting on roughing diamonds. Uh, when you get a 1-1 trump split, you can basically just lay the hand down um, because you know you're going to get uh, the diamonds established. But um, uh, no real excuse uh, for being there, but um, uh, easily done. Uh, we see examples of that kind of uh, um, that kind of mistake fairly regularly. Um, just something that experience uh, will gradually teach you. Okay, guys, I think I've got one more. Um, Name is actually just having a a quick snack, so uh, we'll try one more. Let me just check this.
yeah, just give this one a go and uh, we'll see how we go on. Now, I'm not sure if Ben was here for my uh, lesson on defending against uh, um, two suitors overcalled. Um, if he can, he may be able to use uh, what I showed him to advantage then. So whatever the uh, the double of five spades meant and six diamonds, uh, which seemed fairly reasonable to me, um, over six spades, we are definitely now in non-penalty slam double territory. So here the double is showing no defensive tricks, and so West rightly bids seven diamonds. Ah, now you see. This is where, Ellen, this is not right, because over seven diamonds you are now in control denying double territory. So here you must pass over seven diamonds. So this is showing first round control of diamonds, which may be the critical thing. But the other thing to bear in mind here is, are all the conditions met?
Oh, that's a good shot. Ouch. Okay, now this is quite an interesting hand, but it's quite illustrative. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time explaining this, but uh, you may want to just go away and think about it afterwards. The thing is, if you remember, there were four points that needed to be satisfied before control denying doubles applied. Um, uh, the first one was whether second in hand over the, uh, the sacrifice, i.e. seven diamonds, was the captain of the hand, or if there were no captains, or if South was the captain. So over this, um, essentially, uh, I think North has signed off in six spades, um, and therefore there either is no captain or it's South, because North has signed off. So that's okay. Um, the next thing is uh, um, whether control of their suit has actually been established or not, and clearly at this point it hasn't. But the last thing really is, have we really uh, established that a grand slam is potentially possible here? Because uh, South only bid three spades over uh, the two-no trumpet, um, which isn't a tremendously strong bid. And uh, although North got control of um, the diamonds, um, they're not that strong. Um, and so uh, is, is control of the diamond suit, the only thing that we really need to establish at this point. And I'm not 100% certain that it is. Uh, again, have a think about it, um, if you can remember this hand. Uh, and you can uh, probably find it on the YouTube video from last year, because I've not changed it. Um, and uh, just see what you think. Um, I, I think it's unlucky. Uh, but in practice, even if East-West don't find the opening club rough, and the Queen of Clubs lead was a really good shot by uh, East, well done. Um, in practice, uh, even if uh, the Clara here finds the, the finesse against the Jack of Hearts, they've still always got a club loser, and they've actually no means of getting rid of it, as it turns out. Uh, so even if they get two discards on the heart by finding the club, the heart finesse, um, which is unlikely, uh, then uh, I think they're going to struggle here. Um, anyway, listen, guys, I'd better go to bed because it's uh, nearly half 12. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you found this uh, informative and uh, interesting. Um, uh, like I said, feel free to have a look on the site where on the OCP site where uh, these two kinds of doubles are again explained in a little bit more detail um, and uh, uh, do consider using them with regular partners only. Uh, it's not something you can just sit down with a scratch partner and agree to play because uh, the chances are that most scratch partners will never have heard of this. But uh, if you've got a regular partner, you might want to consider incorporating these kinds of things but you need to have a good example, a good understanding, rather. Okay, thanks for coming, guys. Uh